So now let's talk about this idea of multiple planes of existence paralleling each other all happening at the same time on earth or in heaven but right now on earth and at this point let's restrict it not to everybody every soul but instead just those souls who are saved what kind of thought patterns what kind of thought pattern planes p-l-a-n-e-s what kind of thought pattern planes is God hearing in Christians and when we we'll restrict the group further to those who know they are Christians because you know a guy who calls himself an atheist might have believed in Christ when he was five years old and forgot about it or even remembers but doesn't realize that that really changed his life okay so we want to talk about humans who know they are Christians who actually are saved too what kind of planes of existence are they living on well, your typical Christian is something of a martinet. I should do this. I should do that. This is right. This is wrong. I am good. I am bad. Jesus loves me. This I know. Okay? And that's if they consider themselves devout. Oh, this is good. Oh, this is bad. Oh, this is a sin. Oh, this is not a sin. Oh, shame on that person. That person's sinning. Oh, did I do something wrong? Okay. But most of it is, I am right, you know, self-justification of one kind or another. And paying real close attention to your own morality and the guy next to you's morality and real close attention to, especially if you're in ecumenism, you know, your your, your observances. This is what marks out false doctrine immediately. That you have practiced observances. You know, like the Muslims stick their butt up in the air five times a day. A real God is not going to be interested in that. Is not going to be impressed by that. And it would actually be insulted by that. So certainly wouldn't make it a rule. Counting beads... Wearing funky hats, those funky pointed hats that the cardinals wear in their little on conclaves or whatever. And the funky robes and the surplices and all the junk that they don. And the swinging of incense and chanting. Now there was a valid reason why they developed those things. But that valid reason has long since ceased. And even when it was valid, it was of limited validity and really um, should have been thrown out very soon. It was used as a substitute for um, teaching Bible doctrine to get the, the people to at least concentrate on something with the word God in it. And it was in its more sophisticated form, each one of those pieces of clothing depicts something that is supposed to be related to Bible doctrine. And then the words that are said in the Mass, and this part is true, are snippets from parts of the Bible. The trouble is nobody understands that. So you might as well be doing it in Swahili. Okay? So the, the, the typical Christian is, if he's devout, going through all those stand-up, sit-down, stand-up, sit-down. Oh, well, i got to count my beads at 5 o'clock. And, oh, do, do I light two candles or one? And how much money should I put in the collection plate this time? And, oh, I've got to do three Hail Marys. I, I've got to go to a confession. And I, he tells me i got to do three Hail Marys because I said, damn. And, oh, that's a little racy. You can see parts of your petticoat 
or whatever is today's equivalent of that stupidity thinking. And then, oh, is it Friday? Is Lent coming? Then I, what am I going to give up for Lent? That's the thought pattern that's going on. And oh, I hope Miss McGillicuddy's feeling all right. And oh, oh, it looks like the roof is crumbling on the church. Okay? I mean, we've all been around these people. Their minds are, the bandwidth is like 12. And it's like they're all on little tread, little hamster conveyor belts that they just keep walking, keep walking, and this is what I do next, and this is what I do next, and this is what I do next. And there's no cogitation. And then anything kind of like removed from that, depending on the, the town that they're in. You might be like in Chicago, there's a lot of back slapping and food to eat and gossip and, you know, smile, smile, smile. That's pretty typical of anywhere in the world. You know, the sort of Italian lifestyle or the Greek lifestyle or, you know, the Yiddish lifestyle. That's pretty common in every city. Okay? And then on Sundays, you know, you, you have to go visit the relatives and you bow and you sit in the parlor for the uncomfortable 30 minutes and you drink your tea and you keep hoping for the clock to stop ticking and you keep wanting to go home and you want to go away. You know, I mean, we, we've we all been through the, the daily routine of family life. Or living with relatives and you do all the expected things and your brain is either half numb or you're, you're trying to think about something else while you go through emotions or you're thinking more about what do I do next? What do I do next? What do I say next? Wrote, 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 wrote. W, you know, R-O-T-E, wrote. It's like a robot. That's the plane of existence. Then just above that, and it is above because now we're talking about people who are getting involved in Bible. When they go to Bible class, their idea of the spiritual life that they get out of Bible class is that they're supposed to be a good little Lord Lord Fauntleroy, good little goody two shoes, and well, let's look up the doctrine. And am I right on this? And so and so is wrong in this, and this denomination is wrong on that, and this other denomination is wrong on the other, and and oh, my denomination is right, and blah 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 blah. In other words, they think that spirituality is morality plus being right in their doctrines. And so that's what they're busy doing. And, you know, doing good deeds, of course. Actual thinking toward God is more along the lines of rote prayer. Oh, God, please cause me to know this. Amen. There's not... You don't see the personal dialogue that actually happened between, like, Abram and God, Moses and God, David and God, even Balaam, and the angel of God at any rate. Those were real dialogues. I know you, I'm talking to you. Not talking at, talking to. I can see you while I talk. I can hear you while I talk. Your presence is very palpable to me while I talk. It's like sitting across the dinner table from somebody. But people aren't living the spiritual life that way. They think it's all about what you know in Scripture and how well you can compare it and how many 
tomes of Dear Dr. So-and-So's you've read, and this school of thought versus that school of theology, and the footnotes, and, you know, this this scholar's position is this, the scholar's position is that, the scholar's position is that, and then I'm sort of like 2.5 in between. That's what they think this spiritual life is supposed to be. And it's never the vertical toward God, except for the, you know, the, the sound by prayer. Because they think they're supposed to work, 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 and get it right for God. That they, that this is obeying God. That it's all about obeying God. It never dawns on them. Hey, wait a minute. He's God, you're puny human. There ain't no way that you even can obey God. They say, oh, but you got all these commands in Scripture to obey. Yeah, you got all those commands in Scripture to obey. And honey, you can't actually obey one of them. Not even one. What's the first commandment? You will love... The Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength. That's the Old Testament version of the first commandment. In the New Testament, the Lord changes it, changes the word strength to the Greek word dianoia, meaning thinking. The faculty of thinking. Dianoia means the actual thinking process in your head. Which means that every one of your thoughts has to be on God. Bringing every thought into captivity. Second Corinthians 10.5 That's what he changed the first commandment to me. You can't do it. They couldn't even do the old version, much less the new version. The old version was your, all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Well, but you can't. You have to use some of your heart and some of your soul and some of your strength to, like, tie your shoes, eat breakfast, yell at your neighbor next door, go to the bathroom. You can't do it with all. So then you're breaking the first commandment. You break the first one, then all the rest are broken. You break even one, part of one. Then you break them all. And the other commandments aren't, aren't any easier. Honor your father and mother. You think, oh, I've done that. No, you haven't. You know what honor means in Hebrew? It's to be, like, struck with awe. You can't be struck with awe at your parents. You know, maybe when you're two years old. But once you become an adult especially, you're not struck with awe with your parents. If anything, you feel stuck with your parents. They're starting to go down. You're starting to go up. You start to see the feet of clay in your parents. You can't be awe awestruck. Unless you're mentally ill. And it's not a good relationship to have with your parents. Because then you can't, like, be intimate. The ideal thing is that they're your parents and you respect them and all the rest of it. And then when you get old enough, they become like your best friends. That's the best kind of relationship to have with parents. That's what every parent wants. But not too close so that the parents have their own life, too. You can't obey that. Thou shalt not steal. You say, well, that's easy to obey. No, it's not. Have you ever stolen time? And the answer is yes, every day. Can you say to God that every single minute of every single day that you have lived, you lived exactly the way you should have? And if the answer to that is no, then you stole time. You see the point? The Mosaic Law is impossible to live. 
But if you're living on a lower plane of existence, your idea of what constitutes obedience to God is also wrong. And when you think about your spiritual life, it's, well, I don't sin any of those nasty sins. I didn't sleep with anybody. But Janie across the street sure did. Of course, you just committed the sin of self-righteousness when you thought that. But you're busy, people are busy thinking like that. They're busy telling them that I didn't come in. And part of it is like you were taught to think this way by your parents and by your pastor's teaching style. And so you have this sort of rote sense of paint-by-numbers Christianity. And you don't know any better. I went to church on Sunday. I wore my hat or I didn't wear my hat. I put money in the collection plate. Oh, but did I really put in enough? And I, I and, and when the pastor spoke the homily or, or told us to stand up and sing, I stood up and sing. Fourteen choruses of Just As I Am. And now I'm good for the week. I'm my laundry chore of going to church is done. And God has to bless me the other six days. That's how they think of it. If they go at all. So that's the plane of existence of your typical believer. And if he's devout, he's busy learning Bible, all right. In order to say how smart he is versus the competition, which is some other denomination down the road. And then they're collecting for their bingos and their blackjacks and their this and their that and the other thing. And marching for causes and being pro-life and doing a bunch of things which are totally anti-Bible. But they don't even know because it's not the Bible they're learning. They're developing their own culture, extra Bible, external to Bible, and calling that holy. It's really just like the Muslims. 90% of Muslims do not know what the Quran says. The Quran is full of commands for you to kill other Muslims. Full of commands that you kill any Muslim who doesn't want to be a Muslim anymore. Full of commands to kill Jews. Full of commands to kill Christians. Full of commands to rape, pillage, murder. The whole idea behind Islam is that you're supposed to, you know, take over a, a geographical area become the majority kill everybody else who won't s surrender islam means surrender anybody who won't surrender you're supposed to kill them and then you have peace see that's why they say islam means peace it really means surrender and as a result of surrender then you get peace well there's two ways to surrender surrender and you're dead or surrender and you convert It's just like Islam. That's Islam. That's real Islam. That's the Quran. Muslims don't know that. They are told, they're lied to about what's in their own book. They're given portions to memorize that are nice. Depends on where they are in the world, how much of the, the nasty meaning of Islam is taught. You know, if you're in Pakistan or, you know, Palestinian area or, or Saudi Arabia, some parts sometimes in Yemen, Muscat, Oman, Dubai, Qatar, Syria to some extent, um, definitely Iran, used to be Libya. Tunisia, all this violence is stressed. Certain parts of Indonesia, all this violence is stressed. But in American mosques, they stress the Mr. Nice Guy portion. 
And the Mr. Nice Guy role in the Quran is, if you're not in the majority, you're Mr. Nice Guy. Once you're in the majority, now you start swinging your machete. They don't call it a machete, but you know what I mean. You're sickle. Heads roll only once you're in the majority and you've got power. Until you have power, you're nice, 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 nice. So that's why they're all so nice. The trouble is a lot of Muslims only know that much. Because they too are being fooled. And they are not interested, really, in Allah or the Quran. They're just interested in a nice behavior that makes their egos feel good. So that's why Muslims are often so nice. They're so uninformed. Okay. I mean, you can argue in many ways the same thing about Christianity. A whole lot of people who are Christians have no clue whatsoever what the Bible says. And a lot of them, once they find out, they don't want to be Christians anymore. Same thing for Jews. Okay? The difference between the Bible and the Quran is that people misread the Bible. They're not misreading the Quran. And that's that's proven. If I have to prove it, I will. But it just cursory read through Surah 2 compared to any chapter in the Bible you want ought to be enough to see the point. But that's just it. The plane of existence for the Christian, like the plane of existence for the typical Muslim, is, oh, I must be nice. It's all about morality. And if I say God nicely, and I talk in soft tones, and I, I think legalistically about my behavior and my morality and, and all that all the time, that means I'm holy. Not realizing to the outside person how disgusting a behavior that is. It makes you a person nobody wants to be around. And if that's what being holy means, nobody's going to want to be holy. But there are planes of existence that people genuinely live on. And they live on it in ignorance. They have their own made-up idea of what Christianity is. Their own made-up idea of what Islam is. And they live those hallucinations their whole life. That's their plane of existence. Now, what's an entire rarity is for somebody to recognize, wait a minute, there is no way that anything I can do with this dead and atom body can of itself please you or be spiritual. Just like Paul says in the first half of Romans 8. That's what he says. This body is never spiritual. Anything you do with this body, there's no spirituality to it. And then he's basically, by the time he gets to the middle of Romans 8, it's like, you know, how are you being spiritual then? Because he started the chapter by ending in a climactic end of Romans 7, who will rescue me from this body of death, thanks be to God in Christ Jesus. Okay, well now you're next set up for, okay, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All right, so then it's like, Okay, then what is a spiritual life? That's the theme of Romans 8. And by the middle of it, it's real clear, well, the body can't be it. Well, then what is? And then by the time he gets to the end of Romans 8, you get, you get it. Oh, God is working the body to make it into a spiritual thing. You're not doing it. He's doing it. And that's basically the hope that you live on. So once that's dispensed, he goes to Romans 9. You know, not all Israel is Israel, etc. Now the point there is that once you get on the higher plane of existence, you recognize that he's, it's all vertical. It's all what you do in your head while you're doing whatever with your body. So long as the head is there and you're trying to do that positive with God. Okay, God, what should I be thinking now? And he sends you a thought, you know, or gives you an idea. 
or versus or whatever. And so now it's like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, bi-directional cable, vertical with God, no matter what you're doing with your body. At which point you're living in the rarest atmosphere of the spiritual life. You're living, as I said before, the richness of the spiritual life. So God is seeing millions upon millions of Christians living little Lord Fauntleroy, little goody two shoe, mindless kind of lives where it's, you know, I must do this, I must do that, I must do this, I must do that. Versus what he's hearing in your head. That's a pretty powerful thing. And what kind of prompted this audio is that if he's hearing that beauty in your head, then just as Christ paid for sins on the cross, his pleasure in seeing Christ want to absorb, receive the thin, sin and counter think and reply, that same kind of mechanism is what's deployed in each of us when we're living the spiritual life so that all those other people who are not living the spiritual life but going through religious motions, it's as it were justifying the existence of their lives. Now, there's a distinction between what he actually did on the cross and, as it were, the dividends. I'm talking dividends now. He, what he did on the cross was pay for sins. Okay? But Romans 3.23, there's two problems. you got sin, all have sinned, and all have come short of the glory of God. So the dividends are the glory of God that can now, as it were, start to pay off because he paid for sins and therefore the spiritual capital of Christ in you, the body of thinking Christ in you that's, that keeps on having its rich distribution of blessing is going into your head and coming out of your soul, coming out of your mouth back toward God and therefore all of these other people on this planet who aren't likely to wake up and smell the coffee still are as it were getting the time to wake up and smell the coffee because you're already awake you're already smelling the coffee and you don't know who they are and they don't know about you either doesn't matter God sees the whole. God sees the aggregate. God works everything together for good. Romans 8, 28. And that's your slot on the team once you know it. And you could be, you know, putzing around in the kitchen, making vegetables. You could be washing your car. Doesn't matter what you're doing with your body. It matters what you're doing with your soul. So if what you're doing with your soul is learning and living on Bible, whatever you're doing with your body, therefore becomes a better good deed than all the good deeds being done right now on the planet because all the good deeds being done right now on this planet are not spiritual. A little bit of spiritual is worth more than all the non-spiritual. Christ was only on the cross three hours. Don't you ever wonder why? How could he pay for all sins in only three hours on the cross? That question bugged me for the longest time. And here's the answer, and it's so simple, you, you want to just smack yourself. His thinking is qualitative. A little bit of high quality versus a ton of no quality. Where's the value? Duh. A little bit of diamond is worth more than a ton of dirt. 
If you were to take a ton of dirt to somebody and try to get money for it, you'd get some, depending on who you went to. But if you took, like, a couple of carats of a diamond to somebody, you get a whole hell of a lot more money. And it's much, very much smaller and easy to carry and doesn't stink. And, wow, which is more profitable? Which can buy more? So your little tiny bit of trying to learn and live on what your pastor taught you today about Samson and Delilah is worth more than all the money that Bill Gates has ever given away in his lifetime. He just sent me this verse, so that I guess that ties. The prayer of a righteous man avails much. What does that mean? I think that's at the end of uh, James. A righteous man means a believer. It also means somebody in fellowship, because that ties to Psalm 32.5 and Psalm 66.18. In other words, you have to be between sins and be saved, otherwise your prayer goes no higher in the ceiling. But if that's true, and you're saying asking in the Father and Son's name, and you stayed in the Spirit, you know, when you were asking, or you used 1 John 1 9 once you got out, and so now you're back in again, and you ask again. Okay, being in the Spirit and asking God in the fa Father and Son's name for things, or just talking to Him, is called prayer. And avails much means it accomplishes a lot. Yeah, it does. You can do more by prayer than all the world can do with its works. And the really sad thing is, things are this bad in the world because Christians aren't praying. Pray for everything all the time. What was it? Pray unceasingly? Where did you get that? First, Corinth, First Thessalonians 5, toward the end. Like 5.17... 512, somewhere in there. Pray all the time. That means talk to God all the time. That's what David's doing. That's what the Psalms are. Talk to God all the time. And then all those hardworking presidents who think they accomplished so much, and yeah, they're trying. God will either make it work, or it'll work despite what they do. All the good deeds on the planet do not compare. I mean, I want to say that they're like two different universes, so therefore one drop of you being in the spirit between sins and doing anything, even washing the dishes, has more divine value in it and more blessing, therefore, to the world because of God's pleasure in seeing that divine moment than all the stuff that's being done on this planet. All the good deeds. I mean, that's, in, that's central to the trial. Satan's busy saying, what well, should be about good deeds? Because he wants it to be about his own power, not God's. Okay, but it is God's power. And it is God's pleasure. And then God likes to reward his own pleasure by binging the world with blessing. And you couldn't do that. So it's a bigger good deed than all the world can do. If God, God's little tiniest finger is bigger than all the world's value. Surely that makes sense. So look at how the integration works. Everybody living on these separate planes of existence. You happen to be on a high one because you're thinking toward God and everybody else is thinking laterally about how good they are, how bad they are, how right they are, how wrong they are, comparing each other to each other and are not wise. And you're listening to so still small voice. At the end of the day, the tally on your end about all the value of the good they got done, getting done by God in this case, is huge. And the value of what all the human race produced that day, and <laughs> I worked so hard, wood, hay, stubble. 
many, many tekelu farsin. That's the value of what the human race produces. Weighed, weighed, and found wanting. But you were thinking toward God today. Even while you watched it. Dad, what was that Bible class about? I didn't understand. And to you, it doesn't sound like you're doing anything good. But God is so pleased that you wanted to know that he made up for all the garbage that people were doing in the name of God today. You want to talk about working all things together for good and the Romans 8? Nothing shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Hmm? That's integration, honey, ain't it? Peace out.